an absolute pleasure to have the room as full as it is on this uh, potentially game-changing moment for all of us. Uh, my name is Chikwe Ihekwazu. I'm an Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization, and I lead the new uh, pandemic and epidemic hub here in Berlin. Uh, I'll be co-chairing. It's a real honor and privilege to be co-chairing my colleague. He'll introduce himself, but uh, just one word. I re really stand on the shoulders of, of giants like many of us do. Duncan was a Chief Executive of Public Health England, where I worked for 10 years uh, in my career. So it's a real honor to be chairing a session with you today, Duncan. Thank, thank you, Chikwe. Good morning, everyone. And it is fabulous to be uh, here together. Um, Chikwe says it's an honor, but it is for me because uh, Public Health England worked very closely with Chikwe when he was the director in uh, Nigeria. Um, and so it's great to be doing the, this together this morning. Um, I am the president, did I say this? Not yet. Um, of uh, IAMFI, which is the world's gathering of uh, national public health institutes like Public Health England and the Nigeria uh, Centre for uh, Disease Control. And uh, we'll say a bit more about that in the course of the next few moments. Great. So um, we'll start with a very short conversation with uh, Duncan for the next uh, 15, 18 minutes to set the scene. And then we have two incredible panels uh, to take us forward through the rest of the morning. But, but Duncan, let me start with this. Um, you know, just a few minutes ago, IAMFI, which you lead, uh, just signed a, an MOU with the World Health Organization. Um, Maybe you can share a bit about IAMFI, the MOU itself, but really how that fits into this whole concept of collaborative surveillance that is an emerging term that we're all getting uh, to grips with. So we had the uh, great honor of signing this MOU with uh, Dr. Ted Ross uh, based on uh, many years of working very closely with the WHO, but this takes us to the next level. It's recognizing that the essential public health functions, which are um, pro promoted by the WHO, um, can be deployed at country level and um, in response to emergencies as they as they arrive. And uh, we believe these, this depends essentially on countries developing their capacity and capability in, in public health, and principally. Uh, where we see this at its strongest through national public health institutes. Now, IAMFI exists to uh, strengthen public health institutes um, uh, where they uh, where they are uh, where they exist, and where they don't, we want to uh, promote their, their development. We have 111 national institutes in membership in 95 countries, and the pandemic has uh, we've seen an explosion in interest. Uh, from countries wanting to develop uh, uh, institutes of, of public health. Shall I say a little bit about what they do? And, yeah, please do. Uh, Very important. And so National Public Health Institutes, and many of you will know this in, in the room, of, of course, um, bring together uh, health protection, uh, health security, maybe in today's language, um, uh, prevention and improvement and uh, promotion of good health and vitally emergency preparedness and, and response. Um, institutes vary around the world in whether they include all of these functions, but most are striving towards that, that goal. And the common goal with the WHO is that we see uh, strong national public health institutes in, in every country uh, in, in the world. At the heart of every uh, institute is surveillance, um, and laboratory science, um, and and of course a, a, a huge focus on the workforce uh, necessary uh, to to deploy um, both in uh, normal times and 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 in emergencies. Two unique things: um, every institute in membership of IAMFI is part of their government. Um, you cannot separate. Uh, public health from politics. Uh, if we want to get things done, then we work with our, our politicians. But the second critical thing is that national institutes 
uh, are independent, independent to the science and to the evidence, but not independent of government. And, and so it's a, it's a unique, um, it's, we're not university departments, we're not think tanks, we're not commercial or private sector. All of these have contributions to make, mm. but the uniqueness about national public health institutes is that relationship to evidence and science and to government. Mm. And so this is what we've been talking with Dr. Tretros about and how uh, we want to work together to promote this in, in, I say, in every country in the world. The last thing is the importance of country context. There's not a single way of doing things. This is not about saying, and the answer is a National Institute of Public Health. It's about working with ministries, working in context, working where countries happen to be, and, and through peer-to-peer -peer support, which I don't think I could sufficiently <laughs> emphasize. This is countries helping each other. As much as consultancies are important, they cannot replace or substitute for public health professionals supporting each other. And this is, the, this is what I am is, is about. Can I ask you? Of course. There's been a massive interest in collaborative surveillance. The G7 you've mentioned, G20, uh, we ourselves have been involved with you over the last uh, three or four days. We've had uh, the Gates Foundation involved, we've had uh, the Global Fund, the World Bank, all talking about collaborative surveillance. What, what, you're in charge of this, Chikwe. Um, what, do you, what do you think this is about? Well, Duncan, in a way, the organizations you've just mentioned are also in charge. What we are doing, trying to do at the World Health Organization is having gone through this pandemic or going still going through it, we couldn't possibly come out at the end and continue business as usual. And all of us that have done some of, form of public health training or work in these centers, we remember how we define surveillance. And really that's how we've practiced it for, for many years, you know, we count cases, we count mobility, we count deaths. And any, anyone that has been responsible for decision making in the last two, three years will recognize that it's not enough. You, you can't make decisions on the pandemic or on the emergence of new threats based on our historical classical definition of the work that we do. We have to incorporate other dimensions to that decision making. And we do so, only we have never sufficiently identified it as something we needed to do. So we have considered uh, the political side, the socioeconomic circumstances. We have co considered how people behave and try to measure that the best way we could. But we have not come together as a collective to say, listen, in order to make those decisions, we also have to do this. So really, that's the first thing we're trying to do is define the dimensions around which we collaborate, which we intend to collaborate around diseases, around sectors, uh, bringing in One Health, more uh, the animal environmental sectors, more intentionally mm -hmm. into our conversation across the event life cycle uh, and across geographies, because, you know, the work we're doing is so interdependent on each other. But at the same time, it's not just collaborative surveillance, Duncan. We're, we're organizing our work around what we're now calling the five Cs. And, and this is just as a, a way to remember, but it is really bringing together these functions of collaborative surveillance, uh, countermeasures is the second C. So whether it's research, whether it's uh, IPC, um, Community protection measures, so all the things we've learned about uh, the advice we give people uh, during communities during the pandemic or during any event, because it will vary, and clinical countermeasures, the clinical care side, which we in many countries, you'd recognize this yourself, um, we have not really taken responsibility, responsibility for the clinical aspects of responding to a public health event. So these four Cs, together with the biggest C, on coordination mm -hmm. and trying to now reorganize our work and the work of the world around these areas. But, you know, bringing it back to the work um, that you're doing, you know, we're trying to identify these spaces and bring consensus around them. Ultimately, for this to work, 
requires national institutes, national governments. But basically through the operationalization of national public health agencies, however they're organized, but really someone has to take the responsibility for delivering on this. And one thing we've learned to the emergencies program over the past five, six years is having an emergencies framework with which to respond. And that's really what we hope will happen with national agencies or whoever that responsibility is, is delegated to at the national level in, in every country. So it's just fascinating to hear the conversations. I think there's an emergence of purpose between ourselves and countries, our member states, uh, through the agencies in whose organization you lead. So uh, fascinating times. There's never been a more exciting uh, period for me, I think, in the work that we do. Uh, with the discussions around financing now progressing yes. around the treaty or accord now progressing, it's now our responsibility to define how do we use this to actually um, support the work work that we're doing. So, so Donke, but maybe I'll I'll take this back back to you one more step. Is in your conversations with, with members of the association. And really you represent countries from around the world. And we'll see some of the colleagues yes. uh, come up on the stage in a few minutes. Um, how do you see this conversation going? Uh, institutes having the same type of conversations we've had, mm -hmm. we're having at the national level. Yeah. Uh, how are countries thinking about how to improve their own capabilities, their own um, needs? And really, how are you working, how are you enabling them to work uh, closer together with each other? We, thank the, we are about to hear um, about what 65% of our membership uh, had to say, what they had to say about what they understood by surveillance and integration and, and the um, opportunities that are ahead of us, the important. Uh, opportunity that we must take, um, if not now, when is I think a very important moment. Um, but but I'd add about national public health institutes to your point about so who does the coordination and the the na the natural role of a national public health institute is to be that convener at, at country level. It's an it's at the connection. It's at the interface with uh, all the different sectors. Uh, the animal, the agricultural, the, the human. Um, it covers the geography, uh, the dimensions you've it's about diseases and about the relationship with the healthcare, uh, the healthcare world. Yeah. And that that is like a, a convener and influencer role, but a connector. And and where because no one organization can do can do this. This is, you know, everyone's business, but a National Public Health Institute. Uh, charged with bringing people together about uh, the, the you know the issues that, that that matter. Now we know that surveillance is one of them, but we also know that workforce is what underpins that. And uh, surveillance systems will the point to them as early detection uh, response. The point on purpose of surveillance is the action that that then then leads to. But we know that. You know, I'm not sure what, quite what the percentage is, but it's a high percentage of new things that we find out about don't come through uh, surveillance systems. They come through um, intuitive clinicians or community workers, um, a public health nurse who notices something, or you know, and then they know who to tell. And what we need is uh, to 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 it's it's the blending of the formal and the informal, the interconnectedness and the presence in country of a place that is thinking about this all the time and that is uh, is open to uh, hearing from from people from every conceivable part of, of society um, of course the community um, is on the front line of of this I mean the public chick way as as Perhaps. well as the the primary care systems and and in the various ways that these exist around the world so I would add one quick thing about um surveillance leading to i love the about your work which is better data better analytics better decision making and there's something magical in there about how we take 
um, analytic, what we the how we understand data to how we communicate that data and how we communicate that data to decision makers, but critically also to the public. And we saw this uh, as a as a huge strength in many parts of the world, where ministers and directors and senior scientists from public health institutes stood together. Um, and 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 were persuasive of the science as we understood it. And critically, what we didn't understand, which was also important to communicate. Yeah, I I, I, got, I couldn't agree with you anymore, especially the last part about uh, better decisions. Right? We all think uh, we we hope we can get better at doing this. <laughs> we know it's the most difficult part, especially when there's uncertainty about what that decision is yes but ultimately someone has to take ownership communicate it with authority but still not arrogance in terms of the the science behind it so very very important point something we've learned uh, sometimes the hard way um, uh, but something we can't run away from and I, I mentioned in one of our conversations if you allow me uh, to reveal part of it because you led You've been a CEO for many years, ending at PAT um, is among all the essential public health functions. Many of them are very important. But I, I asked you, what do you worry about the most uh, being called up at 3 a.m. Uh, in, the, in the morning about? Doctor, do you mind just answering that specific, specific question? I think it's a good segue into the rest of the conversation. What, what did I say to you? Well, you, you did say to me, listen, Chikwe, in your very calm, normal way, um, uh, as much as I, 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 everything, you know, I think we have to reduce obesity. I think, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, nutrition is important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, none of that will lead to the, the minister calling me at 3 a.m. Yeah. The, the only thing that will lead to that is a is a either an infectious disease crisis, a health emergency yeah. crisis, yeah. Um, and that we have to prepare for that, take responsibility for that, but not lose track of the the bigger issues in public health. That is so. I mean, the best health protection systems you never hear because because you you're doing the early detection, you're you're responding, you're. You're reducing the risk, and you're managing the, the you know the 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 you, you, the, the harms. If you, this allows national public health institutes to focus on non communicable diseases and the other. Actually, well, we don't. That's not about this morning, but we know that they both matter. But unless we deal with the first, we can't address the second. And so the concern at three in the morning has to be addressed in order to be concerned about what we need to be uh, thinking about next week and the next year and the next 10 years. So we have we have to be able to do both, but we can't do the second without managing the first. Um, perfect. Perfect segue, I think, into inviting a, a few of our colleagues to join, and then I'll pass it to you, Duncan. To yes, thank you. We, we, have, um, we have three colleagues. Could you join us on, on the stage? I'll... Um, and for the next 30 minutes, we're going to hear from the colleagues on screen. Do we have Natalie? Please, you don't let us talk. Okay. Well, um, can I introduce four colleagues? Um, and I'm going to just briefly ask them to, to speak. Um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Eduardo from Mozambique, uh, Johanna from the uh, Robert Koch Institute, and Andrew from the University of Sheffield and the UK Health Security Agency. And we have Dr. Lee Myatt, Natalie Myatt from the South Africa uh, Centre for Disease Control. Um, I want to begin by asking Andrew, who has been the technical lead uh, working um, um, on integrated disease surveillance uh, for a project funded by Gates, um, about what, so what, what have we learned about what, what, when we talk about integrated disease surveillance, 
Uh, what do we mean by surveillance? What do we mean by integration, Andrew? Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, guten Tag, Assalamu alaikum, ni hao. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for an invitation to share with you some of the findings from our survey of National Public Health Institutes. Um, I think there are two components here, Duncan. The first is disease surveillance, and that's a bag of activities that we undertake from the collection of data, the laboratory data, pulling it all together, uh, analyzing it, trying to make sense of it to guide decisions, better decisions, as you say, Chekwe, um, to protect the health of the public. Um, that bit is not so much in contention, but what we found was the idea of integration varied from country to country, person to person, organization to organization. For some, it was about integrating data systems, other it was about integrating IT systems, or is it integration of analysis or of the response? Regardless, what was key was purpose. And I think the theme that emerged for us was um, integration is a vehicle, it's a means to achieving an end. And that end is the better use of data, better analysis, better decisions, exactly as you say, check away, um, to make those decisions that will protect our public. I know you've done work looking at the building blocks. What are the, what are the, what are the key components of, uh, you know, a collaborative integrated surveillance system and the, you know, the literature review and the scoping study that, that, that you under, that we undertook and with RKI, which we'll come on to in a moment. What, what, what are the key components of, of a system that would work? Indeed. I mean, what we found from a lot of our colleagues around the world is that there's so many challenges uh, right down to the grassroots of collecting that data, getting the reagents for the laboratories, getting the sample from a distant health clinic uh, right through to the national laboratory and making sense of that. And it's, it's clear that there are several key building blocks. First, we need that infrastructure, the IT systems, the laboratory systems, the data systems, the protocols and procedures that allows us to pull together surveillance and analysis. The second thing, and it's clear important, um, is the financing. Uh, many of our respondents uh, were concerned about the sustainability of financing, and they needed enough financing to do their jobs. Yeah, so it's about having enough to do it, um, and having enough that will last into the future. The third element was about leadership. Somebody's got to own the surveillance agenda, be accountable for it, to drive it forward, to, to look after it. So there's a need for leadership, as well as the supporting legislation that allows data to be shared, allows organizations to work together. And I guess Darren, uh, perhaps you might come back to it a bit later. That, that might be a role for ministries of health and national public health institutes. The fourth component is looking at the whole surveillance life cycle from the point that you collect your data, analyze your data to the point that you react and respond. Um, we need every part of that process to work. A break in any part of that chain and this whole surveillance endeavor fails. So what is it that holds it all together? And from our study, what we found was that people matter. Our surveillance systems are not just inanimate building blocks. People hold it together. They are the glue. And it is the interprofessional relationships between your clinicians and your laboratory staff and your statisticians and your epidemiologists right up the food chain to chief executives such as yourself, Duncan, previously, communicating to ministers and the, the decision makers. It's the people that hold the system together. And you need these trusted relationships so that people can share information. Because there are lots of barriers, Duncan, such as um, if you think of national barriers, organizational barriers, and when, when people have trusted relationships, they're prepared to work around it to, and the willingness to make it work. And they create communities of practice where they share their knowledge. But at this stage, Duncan, may I suggest that we perhaps turn to our colleague, uh, Johanna, whose team have done amazing work uh, on precisely this element. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So at RKI, we've also, we looked at, at, at countries need around intelligence, around the surveillance and, and, and the workforce. And, and and many of the work that we've done very much mirrors what what Andrew's just set out. But I um I just wanted to pick up on the aspect of training. So what we found is is and and I simplify somewhat. But um 
so they used to be calls for for more data, right? More data. We don't have the data. So now there seems, and, and I'm saying this a bit flippantly, right? But there's a lot of data, right? And there's a lot of training about a lot of different data systems. And, uh, and in some instances, it's not clear whether these trainings are coordinated at country level, whether they're looking at um, what the training is for and whether they're looking at what that particular uh, surveillance platform or surveillance system or data management system is for. And I think it's not to, I don't want to be a downer. There are many good global initiatives and there are strong points which you can take from this in training country public health workforce. But one of the things that we found, I think, was that all these different trainings were essentially offered to the same health workforce, right? So if I say, uh, simplifying, there were 10 health workers and they were, they were now, instead of getting 10 trainings, they were getting 20 trainings, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you're not really sustainably strengthening and building that workforce. And the second aspect I think that, that speaks to that is if you're that health worker, right? And, and, and you guys will know this more, you're gonna take that training, right? Because you're, as an individual, you're gonna get something from it. You're gonna develop professionally. So, so in a way, it, 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 the system perpetuates itself. But I think we do need to think a little bit now about surveillance for what, as you, as you highlighted, what, what is the data system we're looking at? And then what are we training that, that health workforce for? And one second aspect that I just wanted to touch upon was, so one of the things we did find is that the, the field epidemiology training program, so the heroes of the pandemic, right? The field epidemiologists, they've been our heroes. And, and, and that's the good news, right? So there is training around that. So these training programs are beginning in countries. So I think there's something that we can strengthen. There's something Yanfi is important about. Mm. We can build on that. And I think then again, during the, and, and then not just COVID, but I think we've seen this is, is that's one part of the workforce and one particular skill, but how can we build on that? So we, we know we need the multidisciplinary approach. We, we need lab and we do need some bioinformatics if we're gonna do genomics and, and we need the community engagement and risk communication, right? So how can we use these platforms to, to train further? And again, of course, national public health institutes, they are the custodians of that at national level. So we need the strong national public health institutes, but we really need to take a critical look, I think, at, at what we're doing the surveillance for and what we're training for. Thank you. Joanna, thank you. And thank you, Andrew. Eduardo, uh, Mozambique, and you've been, you've been using surveillance in the wider context of, of its impact on health. Would you share with everyone what you've been uh, doing and learning on this? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I, I am happy to share our experience in the uh, uh, working uh, establishment and and, and uh, working uh, with National Health Observatory. So Mozambique is a country that is challenged by many health margins simultaneously. Uh, and this has led to huge and tremendous fragmentation of surveillance systems. And then uh, as an innovative way so that the country could, could deal with that. So those different surveillance systems, they are host their own uh, by different institutions within the government. Uh, and then as an innovative, we embark in establishment at what we call the National Health Observatory, that it's a multidisciplinary platform that integrate not only surveillance and data, but both than that, we have learned disintegrate institutions, those that owns the data, disintegrate experts, those that understand the data, because it's useless if you just integrate surveillance and data, because you don't own those data. If you want more collaboration in terms of getting, pulling together this data, you need them together. Yes. If you need to ask the right questions, we need, mm. That's uh, very interesting. The first piece that we started working with was climate change and health, because mm -hmm. Mozambique is among the top eight countries in the world that are uh, severely hit by cyclones, and the top two in Africa. So every year we have at least two, three cyclones. We start with this platform to integrate. We integrate uh, people from health, med institute from the university, geographers, demographers, yeah. statisticians, math. Yeah. It was nice that most of the best questions were not asked by us as the health, <laughs> was asked by the guy from a uh, uh, math uh, expert. And then uh, since four years ago, we are, every year we are invited by disaster management agents that they meet in September 
to forecast and plan for the rainy season. And we now is kind of a mandatory that we have to sit there and present what will be the impact, the trends of uh, extreme climate event on health. That is important. We combine data for health, no for sure. climate, for mobility, demographic, and the, the uh, demographic of the, the population. Based on that, the country is using this data for better uh, planning. Thank you. Uh, beautifully, catch about the importance of climate change, which is one of the five big big priorities for IAMFI and what Chikwe and I were talking about, about the interconnectedness, about getting people to work together and listening and hearing from those that, you know, are outside of what we would normally think of a, a public health system. Are there any other key areas that you would uh, want to share uh, from from your experience in Mozambique? Um, it's I think the in terms of way forward, then the vision, based on our uh, learning experience, is the paradigm shift because we have been trained. Uh, in 10 seconds, just to share one experience, I, yes. learned, I, I was doing my PhD. Yeah. I have a professor of neuroimmunology. He said that we are not using even 5% of information we are generating. Why? Because we are using this information in a fragmented way. If you take one piece of information, you anal analyze individual, you get 2% of what this tells you. If you combine this with other information, it tells you 10, times more of that. So information is about integration. And he said that this is because we were trained in school. Our brain was trained in boxes. So math, geography, history, uh, and others. So now we have to change the paradigm of our brain. So our brain have to think now different. And then this is, part of the resistance that we have in terms of integration is to change the paradigm at country level and at whole levels. So we have also, beside paradigm shift, so I have example that I am using with my team. I apologize, I don't have time to, 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 to share those, how I try to change the mind of people uh, unless you give me more. No, 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 <laughs> I'd love to. Seconds. <laughs> but, but actually, Eduardo, you should be tracked down over the next two days. Um, because this will, will be lots of opportunity to t telling stories is how we learn. Yeah, time time is not on us. But I want to bring Natalie in. Okay, um, that's Natalie yeah. is using another um, form of surveillance, environmental surveillance, and the experience in South Africa. Uh, Natalie, are you with us? So we can see you. Yes. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning to all the panel members. Um, so yes, in terms of environmental surveillance, this segments the discussion and demonstrates a practical application of how we've collaboratively have worked together. WHO has set up polio surveillance sites over many years where um, the public health institutes and as part of the polio eradication process has set up these polio um, environmental sites. And during COVID, we had to rapidly upscale the environmental health surveillance as part of an early warning system. And how we did that, we did it in collaboration with other national public health institutes. So we learned from what the Netherlands were doing. We learned from what Israel was doing. We learned from what Ghana was doing. We did it collaboratively in terms of the whole of the continent and shared experiences with Africa CDC. And then we engaged with multiple stakeholders within country, with environmental health practitioners, with clinicians, with lab lab laboratory technicians, with local government, with national government, with provincial government, in bringing it all together and most importantly, we engage with communities. And the lessons that we've learned is that this is a collaborative, practical example of how we can rapidly upscale from 18 sites to 87 sites to generate data that demonstrates hotspots and key priority areas where we need to collectively risk mitigate in terms of some of the challenges. So this is an early detection 
system, an early warning system that as part of collaboration with local communities right through to an international collaboration to demonstrate we are the risks, how do these risks triangulate with case-based data? How do they come together and the data integrates in us collectively risk mitigating? And this application can be used for future public health threats, for measles surveillance in wastewater, for hepatitis surveillance, and our next public health threat, antimicrobial resistance. We can use it in specific locations, like for example, in an occupational health setting, a workplace, in an hosp a hospital, on air, pa or air pain sewage system systems. So I think the application is wide reaching. It can deal with other public health threats, but importantly, it demonstrates the collaborative synergy yes. at multiple systems across the surveillance network that we can all use to inform policy and behavioral decision making. Natalie, thank you. Thank, thank you, Natalie. The theme, Chick, we're running through this is this umbrella uh, function that National Public Health Institutes can provide in bringing people together and connecting all these various different, different parts. Um, there is a dimension, Natalie, might, if we have time, come back to you. If I move to Johanna, about the the role and function of laboratories in surveillance and and maybe something what, what you think the future for that might might be johanna yeah thank you duncan and 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 i'll try to be brief i mean i think there's a the the connection between uh b between the laboratory and and the epidemiology is 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 obvious and and the connection we need and i think Again, COVID, I don't want to be in a COVID mindset, but underline that very much, I think we saw the test strategies that countries pursued very much showed what you have in your epi data, right? And 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 and, and for example, at the RKI, to share something national, we, we looked at that continuously, right? So who do you test to, to gain the most learning from your diagnostic capacities? But I think one of the other big things, and I just wanted to briefly touch on that because I think that, that affects or, or that sort of brings us together all again for the shared learning you mentioned, is around the, the genomics and the sequencing, right? And that has obviously been a leapfrog during the pandemic. So I think we've all uh, sort of, or many countries have had capacity increased and uh, and very rapidly. And I think it has been important, but again, it, it's a bit of a question to what effect and 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 what for, right? And there, and I'm I, so I'm very enthusiastic at at RKI. We're very happy that the that the hub, which is a hub for the world, but that the hub is in Berlin. And, and uh, the hub now has a specific role, the WHO hub, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the IPSN, the, the Pathogen Surveillance Network. And I think the question is now, how do we use, for example, in, in the future of, of the connection between diagnostics and, and, and EPI at, at country level, how do we use what the investment that was made during COVID to strengthen what we know? And how do we stand up a surveillance network around this that moves out from uh, that moves out from COVID? And we heard from Natalie about, um, we heard about AMR, you know, that, which is uh, an, an obvious use case in that way. So, and I think that to me is something that demonstrates above all, we cannot do this alone, right? So this is something new. We, we have to learn the public health implications together. They're going to be different depending on our country context, but we still learn, right? We learn from the questions and we learn from our neighbors. So we need Yanfi, we need the hub. We need to come together. Yes, National Public Health Institutes is the importance to have that structure at national level, but we need to be internationally networked. And I really, I, I think this is a bit like, like Chico, it's an exciting time to be alive. So I think, I mean, you know, we're going to do this, right? But we're going to do it together. NPHI is coming together and doing this. Johanna, thank you. Um, it reflects that none of us, uh, we can't do this on our own. We have to do this together. So I want to bring Andrew back in to share a bit more of the learning uh, from the study, the RKI and IAMFI study about uh, what works and inter, inter, in the, at the interface uh, between organizations um, and to share some, a bit more on the learning from that. Thanks, Duncan. And you're right. Things always break down at the interface, isn't it? Whether it's between organizations or countries or district level and national level. If ultimately what we want is global health security, 
we, we need to strengthen global surveillance, but that relies on stronger national surveillance. And that in turn relies on stronger district and local surveillance. You've got to do it at all levels. And if you look within a country, and certainly what we found um, from our survey, high income countries were more likely to have national public health institutes. Countries with more developed um, integration of their disease surveillance were more likely, again, to have a national public health institute involved in leading and taking accountability, as I said, looking after the development of disease surveillance in those countries. So you need an actor an agency, an organization that will take accountability, that will take leadership, that will act as that pool of expertise that will help bring together people across the different sectors um, so that they can share and learn and build their expertise together and develop together. And just one last bit, I mean, it's lovely having Natalie on because when I reflect back on our COVID experience, um, we benefited, didn't we, from the, the amount of information sharing we had coming out from South Africa around the time of Omicron. And likewise, I know other countries have benefited from a lot of the variant analysis that was carried out in the UK that was shared elsewhere with our European neighbors and beyond. So coming back to what Johanna was saying, um, international networks are important. NPHIs have a role to play there, I'm sure of it. Um, and we've got to do it together. Thank you, Andrew. I'm consulting with Chickby on our time, and we definitely have time, Eduardo, for you to tell your story. <laughs> no, um, well, it's 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 very challenging. So, um, to to train brain of people how they uh, can change the paradigm that of the verticalized and boxes that we have in our brain. So, I'll use a puzzle. I have in my office a puzzle that I got from my little daughter. I just grabbed steel from her. And then that is on my office. And then I, when there is resistance within, I, within scientists. So I say, are you seeing this puzzle? People say, yes. I will take one piece of this puzzle. So tell me, can you understand what is the context of this piece? They say, no, this is what you are doing. When you use data as disease, as only malaria cases, you are doing this. You are not getting the big picture. So I think this is one of the examples. So, and then I think that we have to invest also, not only in this, in terms of political commitment, uh, infrastructure, it needs infrastructure for do, dealing with this. It needs expertise. So you need to, in terms of expertise, lastly, in terms of expertise, you don't need to have pool of expertise in one room or an EHR. We don't need. It's a long-term business. It's huge investment. Rely on network, rely on collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, we've spoken about National Public Health Institutes, um, what, what they do, uh, why they matter, the importance of strengthening public health systems alongside healthcare systems, primary care systems, and the breadth of um, the essential public health functions and the role that National Public Health Institutes have in deploying against them and in responding to emergencies. We've uh, spoken about the learning from the study, the RKI study, and the uh, the IAMFI uh, deep dive, um, and you've shared the the learning from from this. In the final few moments, I want to ask each of you, Natalie as well. Uh, what would you want to say to the audience, uh, the one most important thing that we need to get right in this next phase, in this next number of years ahead of us? If we just did one thing that we were doing right, what would it be? Who wants to go first? Andrew. Okay. Um, just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier. The, for me, the one thing would be to build strong, collaborative communities of practice. And to me, that will help bridge a lot of the barriers that we've got. So let's build those networks. Johanna? I think we need to strengthen the public health workforce at country level, and we need to network it internationally. Yeah. Natalie? I think in this collaboration, we need the fundamental principle is rested around trust. Ah. We need to build those trust relationships between 
the scientific evidence of what our scientists can generate between setting a common aligned research agenda, building trust with our communities, building trust with our, within our networks of politicians, within our local, national and international networks. And for me, the fundamental aim of what we do is centered around trust, achieving common goals to ensure that humanity is living in a safe world. Thank you, Natalie and Eduardo. Uh, uh, as I just say that uh, please don't don't look at ideas as integration of data. It more than integration of data is integration of uh, people, integration of institution expertise. Thank you. So, Chikwe, I think that's a brilliant uh, summary. Um, com communities of of practice, uh, the workforce, everything has to join together, and Natalie's trust. To this, I would add one. I would add the importance of confidence and to be confident about our future. No organization system enters a pandemic and expects to look the same at the end of it. Well, not at the end of it, but you know my point. The important thing is that the change is a better one and that we are a stronger world for the learning and the action that we take. Final word, Dr. Tedros, to us this morning was one that we'll all be familiar with. The weakest is where we need to focus because unless we're all strong, none of us are. Thank you. Can I say thank you to our panelists? Um, thank you, guys. And uh, Natalie, thank you. Um, Eduardo. Johanna and Andrew, leave the school. So next I'll invite my brother and ADG uh, for the response part of the emergencies program to lead the final panel of this first session of the World Health Summit 2022. And maybe the panelists can come out already. Um, we'll save a few <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Please join us. Gen Genevieve, do come. And Kirama. Um, thank you, my brother Chikwe. Good uh, morning, colleagues, and maybe good afternoon to those connected online. I'm Dr. Sosifal, Assistant Director General for Emergency Response in WHO. They have asked me to introduce myself, but it's very difficult to do it. And uh, what I can say that I've been working you know, in public health and practicing medicine over the last 32 years, and I've worked from community level to global level and vice versa. Because 30 years ago, I was crossing a river fighting, you know, outbreaks, investigating outbreaks. And just three years ago, I found myself crossing rivers in Congo to go to investigate outbreak and help my team to do so. So I've stopped counting the number of outbreak my team and I have been you know, involved when I reached 500 in 2019. So happy to be with you here and to, for this very important session on the role of, you know, National Public Health Institute for Collaborative Surveillance. I'm happy to have with me Professor Akram from Pakistan, Professor Genevieve from France, and we have also Professor George Gao from China who is connected with us. It was very interesting, you know, to listen to the previous panelists. And uh, I was asking myself, what else can we add? Because they have touched so many important things on the role of national public health institution and lesson learned and critical action we need to take to fight pandemic and epidemic. 
but I'm happy to have you know this rich panel with people from coming from national public health institution to tell us exactly you know about the experience on fighting epidemic and pandemic lesson learned and the critical action that really helped them to be able to defeat outbreaks and pandemic. Let me first start with uh, Professor George Gao from China, and he will be also use the opportunity to introduce himself more properly. Professor George, you have the floor. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever, whenever time zone you are. Um, so I was asked to share, you know, the strategies running in China. Obviously, obviously, it's totally different from any other countries. We are still running the so-called zero COVID strategy. To, to do that, to have a successful zero COVID, you need precisely identified any sources of the infection, trace, tracing back. For the last three, almost three years, we can really do that. Of course, you can always discuss whether or not that feasible or practical in any other countries. But for the time being, at least it still works in China. Obviously, you can see. Of course, here we also have something here you know, compare with you, most of you, you don't wear any mask there. Uh, retrospectively, during March 2020, 27th March, I, you know, I was interviewed by a science journalist, uh, John Quinn, and saying, you know, we must wear the mask at that time. Of course, you know, you, from the very beginning of early 2020 January, and all the Chinese, we started to wear the mask so very quickly. And um, at the moment, most of the Chinese, we are still wearing the mask. Of course, with that mask could be a new and uh, newer or novel pollutant. So that's another aspect we should talk. Maybe not in this state, but in other, another state, when you are talking about your environment protection. However, for this zero COVID strategy, it's based on very strong community level public health service. Community level public health facility in China is very, very strong comparing with any other countries. This is the basis for this zero COVID strategy. Without community level um, you know, public health facility, I don't think anyone can do that. So this is something so we did that, we, or we have been doing that for a while. At least we contribute something for the international public health. China is another example. What we can do in the future for, you know, when you are running those COVID zero, zero COVID. Of course, I know a lot of people think whether or not that could be continued for a long time. I think we are always running the dynamic strategy. We will wait and see. So in my opinion, we already miss the whole world. Miss, we miss two chances to you know, eradicate the virus. First, if we could have ever uh, known the virus as early as before December 2019. And then by then, if we can push the virus to go an alternate way to transmit these animals, we might have got a chance Although the virus cannot be eradicated, but the virus might pass through any animal host. And by then, you might get a much milder uh, virus by then. A second chance, when China decided to have this uh, lockdown strategy, if anyone in the world, all the other countries in the whole world, if we coordinate very well to do all this lockdown strategy, we might be in a position to push the virus if not eradicate the virus into the environment or the dormancy or into the animal host for adaptation, we might be in a different position. Really so this is, a, you know, what I'm seeing about this uh, China's zero COVID uh, uh, strategy. And uh, when you think about uh, from the very beginning, I keep telling people so for any public health emergency like this one, the COVID-19, you need three components from the very beginning for the disease culture. First, size. 
I said, we are discussing something about the size. Size is very important to help you to define the virus, to define the epidemiology, to define everything. So this is the science-based, it's very important. Second component is a public understanding, public involvement, public compartment. Whatever measures or strategies you introduce based on size, but the public health uh, uh, service and the public can help you, can, public can work together with you. So that's very, very important, the second component. And the third component, which is very important, is strong leadership or political will, uh, commitment, and uh, swift administration. Swift administration is very, very important. So whenever you have some suggestions from based on size, whenever the public might be in a way, uh, on, the, on the basis, you can support for the, you know, for some new strategies. And uh, you need a very strong administrative to make this decision. So decision making is very, very important. Let, let's see it again. So three components, science-based, public understanding, and uh, uh, political uh, administration decision making. So those three are important. So our group, this is the lens, I think already coming out in the journal Lancet about these uh, three components. So that's uh, what I want to say. And um, uh, then I would like to, uh, what happened in China with so-called zero COVID? I try to compare this one with so-called tsunami with the waves. You know, whenever you go and visit, the, uh, you know, in the offshore to see the waves, you can wave by wave, but in some area you might have tsunami. I, I'm seeing in the whole world, you have a tsunami, but in China, because this zero COVID, because of the accurate tracing of the source of infection, and we still can see this wave by wave. Oh, I saw, I call it, you know, it's like a spring. You can always see trace back the source of the water for spring, but it's very difficult for you to see a source of water for lake. You know, you can't see it on a lake. There must be a source of water, but it's a lake. You can't see it. But in China at the moment, we have a spring. You can see spring by spring, one by one, so clear. So that's in general, what China is doing. So I still have one minute. The last minute, I want to remind you, foresee the future. What can we do for the future? We have to do the science. You invest into science to understand all those disease X or any other coronavirus or influenza virus or any you know, public health emergency pathogens or whatsoever. And uh, second, surveillance. You know, in addition to the science, we need to do better surveillance. This surveillance, we need international collaboration. We need international coordination. So WHO is a good hub. I know Chikwe is running that uh, Berlin-based, you know, surveillance system. That's very, very important. For that, I hope with the leadership of Chikwe, and by sometime later, and we don't know when, COVID XY, COVID 31, COVID 39, we don't know. At least for the WHO, we see disease X. So do a very good inter international collaborative surveillance. Thank you. That's my eight minutes address. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't go, but uh, you know, thank, I hope thank, I have- Thank you very to, much. Thank you, you Professor Go, for highlighting the importance of strategy for the zero COVID strategy for China and the link between public health, science and governance, and also, you know, the public understanding and for highlighting the role of coordination and leadership. I think these are critical elements for decision-making based on real science. And let me now move to Professor Genevieve Shen. Please. Yeah, thank you and, and good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking on, on behalf of National Public Health Institute, Santé Publique France. This institute is a scientific agency that was created by integrated 
integrating several of the essential uh, missions of public health as advocated by WHO, monitoring uh, the health status of the French people, response through uh, prevention and uh, health promotion, and management of strategic stockpiling and the health reserve. So our mission or our missions are to inform decision makers at national and regional levels with the best possible evidence and to make the information public to all citizens. During the pandemic, we designed and implemented our activities in an integrated manner across this entire continuum of essential public health missions. So several concrete examples. The first one is, of course, around collaborative and integrated surveillance based on different sources of data involving different networks, a layer from uh, uh, professional health professionals uh, reporting case from the community uh, through sentinel surveillance, syndromic surveillance, lab tests, and seroprevalence studies involving so many networks um, and uh, strong partners for interpreting uh, data uh, together with the, 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 the institute. A layer from, uh, of, of professionals from hospitals reflecting on the severity of the disease and burden on the healthcare system through hospitalizations and uh, admissions to intensive care units, and of course a layer with death and causes of death. And all indicators, so we started with around 20, now more than 120, are used to analyze trends and also check consistency among uh, each other. The indicators uh, are calculated at the thinnest possible level of territories. And one of our specificity is to have uh, regional offices, uh, which allow to integrate national and subnational levels, but also involve a qualitative analysis of territories. So what we call the vulnerability level to, to the virus on the top of quantitative indicators. This means incorporating in the analysis social or structural dimensions like urban versus rural, some economic activities, clustering of socially disadvantaged uh, housing. So to inform and support regional decisions and inform citizens to increase the understanding of decisions. Regarding the response for the most socially uh, vulnerable uh, people, among others, we showed that they were those exposed, the, the most exposed to COVID and also who paid the uh, largest, huge, uh, um, the hugest um, burden uh, uh, of COVID. And so one concrete example was to, uh, as a lever, uh, was to uh, mobilize um, a method of knowledge mobilization involving all actors, researchers together with associations, NGOs, elected officials, decision makers, and share the best evidence to improve our tools to increase health literacy or also have some actions of mediation uh, towards this population to increase screening, to increase also trust in uh, vaccination. We also need to be reactive at each new phase of the pandemic, of course. And then as an example that was uh, already mentioned, we scaled up uh, genomic surveillance in a consortium, including uh, both networks of surveillance and research. And we started in 2020 with 3000 sequences uh, that were performed, and now uh, in 2021, 2022, um, the whole network of laboratory um, have uh, produced more than 550,000 sequences. And so not only this has been instrumental to inform the dynamic of COVID in our own country, but also uh, for global security by sharing sequence, for example, in the uh, GZ platform. Uh, another example was, of course, to include vaccine, vaccination coverage as a new indicator in the surveillance system and the daily dashboard uh, that, that we uh, publish um, uh, for, for citizens. And so optimizing response by prevention involves also regular surveys, 
specific surveys of behaviors like the barrier measures and addition to vaccination. We use for that a specific study called COVID-PREV. It started as soon as March 2020. It's a sample of 2,000 French people that are interviewed regularly. They, it's currently every month. We are at wave 35 uh, in last set September. That's a great network with social scientists and, and also um, underlining the importance of mobilizing also repeated cross-sectional uh, surveys uh, to uh, improve surveillance. Finally, the virus is not all, and that was, uh, that was underlined as well. Uh, this is a syndemic shaped by negative interactions between uh, the virus and other conditions. And that COVID-PREV uh, cross-sectional study was also used for mental health monitoring with the hypothesis that uh, any crisis has a deleterious impact on mental health. So we have identified uh, through that, um, and thanks to this uh, survey, a deterioration of uh, indicators after the summer in 22, and that was consistent with other syndromic indicators and also alerts from our own network of pediatricians. Um, mental health, although fully part of health, of course, globally, uh, was still very much taboo. Uh, so based on the literature, we designed a social marketing campaign aimed at uh, improving health literacy on signs and symptoms, encouraging support from relatives and friends and also referral, of course, to uh, medical resources and all types of existing uh, resources, uh, of course, given the diversity uh, of needs. In terms of few perspectives and lessons learned, the first one is to move to uh, integrated surveillance for the winter respiratory uh, virus uh, as soon as this uh, winter, of course, and also to uh, have uh, a closer links uh, with uh, research uh, networks and communities to uh, uh, make the, uh, of course, to improve the evidence and to, to make uh, also the evidence much more used very concretely. That's the work of, uh, of a public health institute to be concrete and operational. And so closer links with research are really very important. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Genevieve, for the excellent summary uh, presentation highlighting the need for coordination of information from different sources, different agencies, but also the need to really target to vulnerable population and for describing the way you manage to increase genomic sequencing to better understand the dynamic of transmission of, of the pandemic. I think this is extremely important but also for adding, you know, monitoring of, of mental health, because most of the time we are attempted to focus on quantitative data, but it's really important to also analyze qualitative data to even understand why the numbers are going up or going down. Because you can see many countries very happy because the numbers are going down, but they don't understand why the numbers are going down. So they'll be surprised to see number going, the numbers going up again. So thank you very much. And let me now call on Sir Ami Ikram from Pakistan. Thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, let me start with, I mean, for years and years, we have been talking of a pandemic eventuality. And finally, in the modern day science and the modern day world, we landed up in a very critical situation. Uh, starting from the international health regulations, moving down to global health security agenda, and then the joint external evaluations. I think uh, things have been uh, helping a lot, especially the de developing countries. But uh, I think we are, let's hope we are coming toward the end of this uh, crisis and uh, whatever good or bad coming out of the COVID crisis must be immediately uh, translated uh, into strategies and policies. And that's, I think, the most important key thing. Now, coming back to a uh, response in our own country in Pakistan, the government of Pakistan established a national coordination and operation center in the very beginning, which provided the platform for all the stakeholders with a very multifaceted approach, uh, whereby the public sector, the private sector, the NGOs, and the social organizations, uh, 
uh, all the stakeholders, academia, experts were taken on board at a central level. There was a central policy which was formed and implemented all across the country. And this definitely is one of the key uh, success uh, uh, for our country. <clears throat> Uh, talking in particular, I would like to highlight uh, some of the areas, starting from the diagnostics, that we started off a very few tests uh, uh, that were available at the National Institute of Health, moving down to more than 200 labs all across the country performing PCR. For the first year, we never got the antigen testing uh, uh, allowed in the country. Uh, and not only that, uh, ensuring the quality control and quality assurance at the national level as well. Uh, with all that, we also established during the crisis a center for genomics, uh, in particular starting off with COVID, but now it's being uh, utilized uh, for other things as well. Uh, and then the second part was uh, basically uh, the testing, tracing, and quarantine, the TTTQ methodology, which, which we really evolved because during the first uh, uh, wave, uh, the country underwent a total lockdown, which was uh, definitely uh, very difficult for a developing country. So with all that, uh, the government and the National Command Operation came up with a uh, smart lockdown uh, technique, which uh, helped a us a lot over the next few waves, because uh, with this, with the digital transformation, we could uh, trace out the hotspots within the cities, only those streets or those areas were locked down and rest were open. Uh, the third thing uh, that came down was the vaccination and Pakistan, uh, in the very early phases, uh, launched a na national immunization management system, which was directly linked with the national database. And uh, it helps it a lot. We strategize for the cold chain maintenance uh, in the very early phases. And uh, we procured vaccine from the different uh, uh, sources. And uh, one of the another success indicator, we being a developing country today, uh, Pakistan is approaching 90% uh, of uh, immunization for the eligible population, which is 12 years and beyond. And uh, with the partial vaccination is 95%. So that's again, a huge success that we've retained uh, with all the facilities uh, that we could evolve during this period. Now, beside that, we recently started the pediatric vaccine campaign. And the first target was 8 million children from five to 11 years of age. And uh, in the first go, we have already attained more than 90% results. Moving on, capitalizing what was going on, I think uh, directed research, and uh, we started off the uh, clinical trials, especially for the vaccine for the first time in the country. That was again a good success because uh, it brought in so many trials to the country, and uh, we could definitely come up with the potential that we can serve, uh, because you're doing a clinical trial, you're not serving your country, you're serving the globe. So that was the aim. And then moving on to the next stage, uh, definitely we within a country we produced 20 million uh, of uh, COVID vaccine uh, within NIH. And based upon performance and assessment, fortunately, we were also selected uh, as a hub for messenger RNA technology transfer under the TRIPS waiver. Uh, so I would say that's a, again a big success for a country like Pakistan. And uh, moving on and on, uh, there's so much to share, but uh, as we were coming out of the challenge with all the efforts, unfortunately, we uh, became the victim of climate change. And uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, one third of the country uh, remains uh, inundated uh, with 33 million people displaced and uh, so much of infrastructure, roads, bridges are gone. And it will take years definitely to come up back to that level. Uh, but side by side uh, is the issue of uh, infectious diseases. We've got an increased number of cases of malaria, dengue, and then moving on to acute forty diarrhea. Uh, there were uh, initial outbreaks of cholera, which were definitely controlled with all the measures, and uh, then moving on to skin disease and then leishmaniasis. Now, I would say um, COVID has taught so much things. So we launched the system in parallel for all these uh, diseases. We have a system of notifiable diseases. And I would say a lot of credit uh, goes to the integrated disease surveillance and response, which we have been working for the last four years plus time. And uh, we launched it, we made it much more methodical that is being now utilized uh, for the uh, flood hit areas as well. Uh, so it, it's all the integration. Uh, so I, I would, uh, what I would suggest, I think um, uh, as already pointed out by Chikvi for the seas, I think we need to collaborate, cooperate, coordinate and make the things collectively in order to serve the community for consolidation. 
we have to join hands together, global level, to make it a much more safer and a healthier place. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ikram. And let me also express our solidarity with Pakistan. I have members of my team right now in Pakistan working with you to really help to protect the population from the consequences of, of the flooding. So we are really you know, aware of what is going on. And just show us the interrelationship between so many factors from climate change to security to deforestation to something. We'll continue seeing more public health emergencies and uh, using the existing system like your EOC, you know, integrated this several system also with the polio capacity to be able to accelerate COVID-19 vaccination is amazing. Uh, also the investment into the, you know, <laughs> clinical trial to save the world. Congratulations for this excellent work. And uh, so one, Question to, to all of you. We have heard from Duncan, you know, the need to be scientifically independent as a national public health institution, but at the same time, you cannot be independent from the government. How do you manage this type of relationship? And uh, how, what are the key <laughs> lessons we can use to advise other countries? I will start with Professor George Gao from China. Oh, yes. Uh, can you say again? Is it a water particular answer? Would you uh, country? Would you like me to be uh, to answer? Sorry, I didn't catch question. your point. Okay. Now I was highlighting the need to be scientifically independent. You work based on science, but at the same time, you cannot be independent from political decision. How do you manage this type of relationship? Ah, I think that's a very that's a very very good, very interesting. Very difficult question, you know. From time, from time to time, and to coordinate the science and uh, the uh, policy uh, make, making, it's very hard. Um, you know, think about the COVID nineteen. You know, whenever you know it already been a, a pandemic. You know, so many policies, so many strategies already very. It's already too late. So this is, I saw the question from the audience ask, you know, how can we stop the next potential pandemic? In my opinion, I think scientifically, uh, because of the 21st century technology and science, I think we are in a good position. And politically and uh, um, also socially, it will be very difficult, you know, think about the public the public can the public be ready to accept any suggestions or proposals, and also can the government or can the decision makers accept the advice from the you know science based uh, proposals? You know those are the very very difficult question. I think that will be the open question to any country. We need to think hard how we can do together. Thank you. Thank you. The same question to Geneviève. Yes, well, that, that's, uh, that's of course a, a challenge, but uh, for, for the agency, the agency is, uh, is a scientific agency, so uh, we remain on, uh, on science, uh, <laughs> and we, we know we don't go behind uh, that uh, mandate, but uh, fully, uh, of course, uh, um, have uh, this mandate of remaining on science um, and, and also acknowledging that uh, uh, policy decisions uh, are based on science but might also incorporate other dimensions that are not part of our uh, mandate. So, so we also need, of course, to, to acknowledge uh, that. And that's the, uh, uh, in a democracy, that's also the respect to, uh, uh, to uh, po political uh, staff. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's a um, just like I would say uh, he wants to get a squad behind as the cricket world cup is on. Uh, with all that in mind, I think uh, uh, um, the simple definition I keep uh, explaining to the people is: you want to invite guests, definitely you have to prepare the prepare the food before they come. So it's just like that. What we did at NIH a few years back, we started uh, preparing a platform uh, which could serve the country, and uh, we as uh, there is a devolution the 
provinces and the region, they are independent. We wanted to get them dependent on us. And that's, I think, once we were ready, the COVID crisis uh, was there and uh, they, they definitely started banking them on us. And I think this uh, in turn showed the confidence of uh, the government uh, uh, that boosted the efforts. And we had a new legislation whereby seven different institutes, including the CDC Pakistan and the research center, they were all placed uh, under NIEH. Uh, in turn, talking volume about the confidence that the government reposed uh, within NIH alone. Uh, definitely, it uh, comes under the Ministry of National Health Service Regulation and Coordination. And with, with, with all the efforts that have been uh, done during the COVID crisis and as we move on uh, during the current uh, flood crisis, I think the, the government owns us. And... Uh, uh, there's a political will and yet another thing that has been a success that definitely uh, we have been working with different donors and partners now trying to make those uh, timely objective uh, achievements and with all the transparency make it, 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 it plausible for the government to understand the meaning so that's one of the reasons that we launched the integrated disease surveillance and response system with the uh, huge governmental funding that owns now the FETP program and the surveillance and public health labs all across the country and similarly for the AMR. So I think it's it's your own inner self, how you take it along and then definitely you get the <clears throat> political support and backing. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ikram. This is really excellent. And I can hear from all of you the need for coordination because we are working with so many entities. The need for collaboration. We have different data sources. We need to be able to analyze in an integrated manner. And we need confidence. You know, when we have this confidence from the political level, we can do our work in an independent way and advise for, for decision making because the purpose of integrated you know, surveillance is for decision making. We are not just doing surveillance for the purpose of doing surveillance. And we can see that. Uh, we need integrated surveillance started from the community level to be able to understand what is happening and anticipate what is happening because we need surveillance for prediction, for prevention, but also for response. So making sure that the system is in place already before we have a big crisis is extremely important. And uh, we have seen also all the investment on genomic surveillance. This is so important understanding diseases. If I just look at the way we understand now Ebola because of genomic surveillance, you're able to see within one outbreak, multiple outbreaks happening. The same for COVID, monkeypox and others. And uh, it's really important to continue investing in this capacity in all LMIC countries to make sure that when we have a disease starting in a you know low resource countries, we can understand exactly what is happening instead of waiting until you know developed countries are affected to be able to invest and understand what is going on. So the role of national public institution is critical, and we need to invest ahead to make sure that you know the role and responsibilities are clearly defined so we can, you know expect in a more predictable way how countries are going to react when they have public health event instead of waiting for the crisis to decide on who is going to lead, who is going to play this role. I think this is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So let me conclude here and uh, give a round of applause to our panelists, our excellent panelists, before going back, giving back the floor to Sikwe and Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So th thank you very much. Uh, so it's an excellent panel. We've learned a lot. Duncan, what do you think? What are your initial reflections? Um, uh, well, uh, the foresight of the WHO to have promulgated and promoted the essential public health functions and how we interpret and make sense of those in every country on, on the planet. And we've heard from Mozambique, France, the UK, Pakistan, China, Germany, and South Africa just in the last 90 minutes. Um, I can't tell you the privilege of leading IAMFE, where we have members striving to make this work in every part of the world. And over the course of the next few years, we hope to make that the entire world, not because we think that's the object, but because we want to see strong public health capabilities in every part of the, the world. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, learning from each other uh, and supporting each other. 
um, are at the heart of uh, getting this right. So can I say thank you, Dr. Tedros, for his support to you and to Saucy, for your support and for the entirety of the, the senior team uh, here at uh, the WHO. And uh, see how much we look forward to working together and to making uh, you know, real practical, uh, Genevieve says, concrete sense of the MOU that we've just put together, together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. I, I think, yeah. You know, just spending this morning listening to the breadth of experiences, ideas from across a small selection, actually, of national public health agencies has been has been just incredible. From you know, hearing that this is about a chain and that we have to invest in each of that, every part of the chain for the chain to be strong and that people actually hold that chain together. We've heard about the challenges and opportunities of more training opportunities. And I bet in the new proposals being sent to the Financial Intermediary Fund, we will find lots of trainings in those plans and we have to all collectively think whether those are the right investments uh, to be making. We've heard about integrating institutions, not just data. That takes political leadership, very difficult, but we need to advocate for that if it's necessary. We've heard severally about changing the paradigm around the work that we, we're doing. Natalie gave a very great example around the use of uh, wastewater surveillance set up for polio uh, for COVID. But we shouldn't be negotiating across disease areas on platforms to be used. These things should come naturally and be available to any disease. So, you know, I've got a few papers and in the past, even in Nigeria, we've celebrated how we've used EOC, polio EOCs for other things. But it's no longer a point to celebrate. These things should be integrated in the very, from the very beginning. We've heard about how national responsibilities are great, but the best opportunity is being internationally uh, networked. We had an excellent example around puzzles. I'm going to use that one yeah. as, as often as I, I possibly um, <clears throat> can. We've heard about integrating surveys and into surveillance. Uh, in fact, in many countries, these things are still separate and every time you're building a new team for a new survey, uh, which really should be carried out by the same teams and the need to do mental health surveillance and monitoring in addition to infectious disease surveillance. We've been challenged about the big, how to retain scientific autonomy and political influence. And this is a very hard uh, problem, but one that we have to take on. We have to really step forward and lean into the political decisions and not hide behind our screens, but also be behind the screens to make sure that the science is authentic. And, you know, really ended that uh, Professor Inkram is here, uh, despite the big challenges that we have in Pakistan at the moment, is a real demonstration of how we can come together as a world uh, to address some of the hardest problems facing us. And this is what we do in the emergencies program in WHO every single day, uh, work on these big challenges. And the new pandemic hub here in Berlin is really to support the work being done in national public health agencies, in our own emergencies program. The hub and surveillance writ large is not worth anything if it's not supporting decision makers, supporting the response in real time, in the middle term and in the long term. So the purpose of our existence is our ability to serve our own program led by the response division led by SOSI and the rest of the emergencies program and the ability of national public health agencies to do the work they need to do. And I look very much forward to working with the rest of you. Uh, over the next few years. And I'll end where I started by saying how much an honor it has been, Duncan, uh, to lead this uh, panel with you. I think it's a real testament to the community we're creating. And I hope that in the next few w w World Health Summits, I'll take a step back and one of the colleagues sat at the back of the room will be in front leading the next <laughs> panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to you all.